Welcome to my YouTube channel and to this video on old school. That's right, old school. We're going to look at Passover and Pentecost, trumpets and tabernacles, calculating it via old school. In other words, the way it was interpreted through Moses in the Bible. Today we have Easter on the 31st or thereabouts of March, and that's not Passover. Passover is going to be towards the end of April. How do I know this? Well, because they use old school techniques to determine when Rosh Hashanah is, God's Rosh Hashanah, and that's the Rosh Hashanah that he gave Moses in Exodus chapter 12. He told Moses and Aaron in Exodus 12, 2, that this will be the first day of the first month of the year. And when was that? Right towards the end of the ten plagues and about two weeks before they left in the Exodus out of Egypt. This is when the barley was ripe because Moses and the children of Israel needed a food source for the first 30 days before God instituted the manna from heaven 30 days later after coming out of Egypt. And Moses came out of Egypt about the first or second week of May, according to Stellarium, where we plotted a full blood moon right around midnight Egypt time on or about the time when the experts think that the exodus took place. And that's the only full blood moon that we could find presenting itself from midnight to about three in the morning in that time frame for about a hundred years both ways, which means the first Passover was in the first or second week of May, which means Rosh Hashanah was in the last week of April. That means that Rosh Hashanah is not the first day of the seventh month of which the current Hebrew culture observes. That came from Babylon. God never called the seventh month anything other than the seventh month. And he called the first month the first month. And that first month he identified as Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the first month of the calendar of God. And I found some scriptures that confirm this. If you go to Zechariah 1 7 and Zechariah 7 1, we see in chapter 1, verse 7, upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, note that eleventh month, which is the month of Sabbat. That is the eleventh month according to Rosh Hashanah being on April or May of our calendar year. The April or May that God identified in Exodus 12 verse 2. And this is not a religious event that's taking place as in a ritual rite or whatever. It's an actual activity, an event that took place before the throne, and it wasn't an agricultural event. It was a political event, a religious political event dealing with who's going to be in charge of Jerusalem. That's what this whole thing was about with Zechariah. It says, In the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he goes on to describe this vision that they had. In Zechariah chapter 7, verse 1, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah again in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Chislu. Chislu is the ninth month according to a calendar which begins on the Rosh Hashanah of Exodus 12, 2, which is April or May. So there are two passages in Scripture that confirm Exodus 12, 2 as being God's calendar. The calendar that the Hebrew society uses today, where the seventh month is the first month, that doesn't compute. And it's nowhere in Scripture. That came from Babylon. It's named after a god, Tishrea, and they call it the month of Tishri. Now this is important because everything rests on when Rosh Hashanah begins. And Rosh Hashanah basically is the harvest of the barley grain. And you can see by this picture that the barley has not been harvested as of yet, as of the last week of March. It'll be harvested around the first or beginning of the second week of April. And that's when Rosh Hashanah is going to take place because it's going to be a new moon on or about the 10th of April, right after that enormous eclipse that's going to scorch across the United States, whose path will go through seven cities named Nineveh. Wrap your head around that. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you how the ancient Israelis and Arabs 
determine the first day of the month. They did it by finding the sliver moon, the first visible sliver moon, after three days of darkness, where the moon is 2% illumination waning to 0% illumination, in, in other words, a fully dead moon. That's normally when a solar eclipse takes place, because the moon is in front of the sun. Followed by the third day, which is a 2% waxing illumination. Well, the human eye cannot pick up 2%. It has to be about 3 to 5% before you can discern that sliver, and that determines the first day of the month. So we're going to look on or about the time when the barley harvest is predicted to be harvested, and we can look on Stellarium to see a moon anywhere from 3 to 5% illumination. And here I'll throw it up on the screen for you. This is at sunset on the 10th of April. You see the horizon moving up to the sun, in reality, it's the sun moving down to the horizon, but once that sun sets, you see the moon is right on its tail, coming right behind the sun. Once the sun goes below the horizon, then you can see that five, it's, it's about a 5% illumination. The day before, it only got to 1% illumination. You would not have seen it. So at sunset on the 10th of April, we have a 5% illumination just minutes after sunset, and that is discernible for about an hour and a half. Then the moon slips below the horizon, and you won't see the moon until the next day. And this is how every first day of the month is determined. It's determined by a waxing moon just off of a zero illumination dead moon following the sun at sunset. Now it's important to realize that the way they determine this is that the Sanhedrin and or the leaders of Israel would send out people at this time, at sunset at this time, for a couple hours to see if they can discern that sliver moon. And there's only a one to two hour window which this can take place. So they're not out there all night. They're just there at sunset. And once the sun goes below the horizon, they know to start looking for that crescent. And if they can see that crescent, you have two witnesses. And the witnesses go back to the Sanhedrin and say, we have seen the new moon. It's a new moon. There's something new about it. It's brand new in the heavens. It's no longer a dead, fully waned, fully zero illumination moon. It's now new. There's something new about it. New moon. That's old school. And they come back and they proclaim it, that they witnessed it, and they blow the trumpets. And they declare the first day of the month. That's old school. New school is, you dial it up on Google and they tell you that the new moon is a fully waned zero illumination moon, which it's not. For some reason they got it stuck in their head that that is new. A new moon. It's not a new moon. It's a dead moon. Totally dead. There's no life in it. There's no light coming from it. There's no light being reflected from it. So it's a dead moon. It's not a new moon. A new moon is casting light for the first time for any particular month. So again, I'll run this video again of the sun setting and the moon setting, and you can see that there's only about, if you look at the clock in the upper right hand corner, you'll see that only about an hour, hour and a half has transpired between the sun setting and the moon setting. And once the moon sets, there's nothing to, to discern anymore. You can't see the moon, so why stay out there and keep looking for the moon when it's below the horizon? So there's only about an hour to a two hour window every month at the beginning of the month when you can see that sliver crescent moon. That's how it was done for thousands of years and that's how it's not being done now. If you Google Passover 2024, the Hebrew culture comes up with April 22nd. That would be, i um, guessing, around sunset of April 22nd, 2024, a Tuesday. And according to Stellarium, that's not even a full moon. It's 99% full. It's almost a full moon, but it's a waning full moon. And Passover follows the day of preparation. The day of preparation normally lands on the full moon. And the day after the day of preparation is Passover, the first day of the seven days of unleavened bread. And that's normally at 99 to 98% illumination. And you'll see that they're off by two to three days. So I'm going to find Rosh Hashanah, that's the first thing you have to do, and all the other appointed times of God are based on Rosh Hashanah, because that's the first day of the year, and everything's calculated to the first day of the year, and I contend that it's sunset 
the 10th of April. This is when they start harvesting the ripe barley, and it will not be ripe until that time because you need the ripe barley for the seven days of unleavened bread, both for the unleavened bread and for the first fruit barley wave offering, which is made from ripened barley grain. So if you look at the calendar that I have here, I've marked sunset the 10th of April as Rosh Hashanah. You count 14 days from there, and on the 14th day, that is the day of preparation. That is the day that you slaughter or crucify the lamb. That is the day Christ was crucified. At the very end of that day, when the sun is setting, Jesus was put into the tomb. And that began Passover. That began the first day of the seven days of unleavened bread. 14 days added to the 10th gives us sunset the 24th of April as the day of preparation and sunset the 25th of April as Passover and the first day of unleavened bread. The next thing you look for is the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath that falls within that seven days of unleavened bread because the day after that is the first fruits wave offering. That weekly Sabbath is at sunset, Friday the 26th of April. The wave offering is presented during daylight hours, so that'll be before sunset on the 28th of April. That is first fruits. That is when you start counting seven weekly Sabbaths completed. You have to complete them. And I'll throw the Hebrew there up on the screen. Here it says these Sabbaths have to be completed before you start the next part of the equation where you count 50 days. This is all contained in Leviticus chapter 23. You can start with verse 14 and 15. You shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until that selfsame day that you have brought the offering unto your God. In other words, when you bring in that barley grain, you don't eat any of it until that is offered to God. That's done by the farmers who are bringing this in from their fields. They bring a handful in and they pound it into flour and they make cakes into it and they present it to the priest on the day after this, the weekly Sabbath that falls within the seven days of unleavened bread. Verse 15, And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheath of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. You shall complete seven Sabbaths. Not seven weeks, seven Sabbaths. There's a difference. A week is not a Sabbath. A Sabbath is a rest day, the seventh day of the week. They're intertwined but you have to complete seven Sabbaths. And after that seventh Sabbath is completed, you start counting 50. That's verse 16. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days, and you shall offer a new grain offering, or meat offering, that means grain, unto the Lord. That's the summer wheat. So you, it's another first fruit wave offering at Pentecost. This is Pentecost that it's talking about. And you shall bring out of your habitation two loaves of two tent deals, and they shall be a fine flour of the summer wheat. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. So this is seven Sabbaths completed, followed by 50 days. Well, what's seven Sabbaths? If it's related to seven weeks, related now, it's not the same thing, but it's just related. Because you have a Sabbath at the end of each week. That's about 49 days plus 50 days, that's 99 days from the weekly Sabbath that falls within the seven days of unleavened bread. So Pentecost is not in June, as you will see here on the calendar that I provide you. Remember what was revealed in Acts chapter 2 when Pentecost was fully come. The apostles and disciples were accused of being drunk on new wine. Well, new wine doesn't occur until the grapes are ripe and ready for harvest, and that doesn't happen until August or September. And according to the calendar that I have up in front of you, I have Pentecost on the 4th of August. In fact, this year, 2024, if you Google Pentecost 2024, you'll see that it's scheduled for May 19th, the middle of May. There's no grapes ready for harvest in the middle of May. No, the harvesting of the grapes is normally a middle to late summer event. And that's the only time you get new wine. I believe that's why God allowed that accusation in Acts chapter 2 to clue us in as to when the true Pentecost is. So let's recount some of the stuff I just did. I found when Rosh Hashanah is, the first day of the first month of the calendar year, God's calendar year, and that's determined by the first visible, old school now, old school, the first visible crescent that is visible to the human eye on or about the time of the harvest. And the harvest is going to be around the first or second week of April. 
and it just happens that we have a 5% illuminated crescent moon at sunset, or I should say moonset, which is just directly right after sunset, on the 10th of April. Count 14 days to get the day of preparation. That puts it on the 24th. That's the day that the lambs are sacrificed in the temple by the pilgrims and by the chorus of priests that they have. And that's during daylight hours on the 24th. When sunset approaches, they go back to the dwelling places and they bake the lamb, they crucify the lamb, they bake it. And then when sunset occurs, uh, at sunset the 25th, that is Passover. That's when they consume the lamb. Then we look for the weekly Sabbath that falls after that, the first weekly Sabbath, and that would be sunset Friday, the 26th of April. The first fruit wave offering thereof is performed during the daylight hours during the, on the 28th of April before sunset. Count seven Sabbaths and complete seven Sabbaths after that day, which is sunset on the 28th of April. And that lands you on sunset the 14th of June. That also happens to be... 49 days after that first fruit wave offering, so that is the first day of the festival of weeks. You complete that Friday into Saturday, you complete that, so at sunset, the 15th of June, you start counting 50 days. And that brings you to sunset, the 3rd of August. That's 50 days. You complete the 50 days, the day following is Pentecost. So Pentecost is sunset, the 4th of August. You complete six of those months, starting in Exodus 12, 2. That begins the first day of the seventh month. And again, you go out and you look right at sunset, on or about the time when the moon is completely dark. You go the next day and you find that we have a, an illuminated sliver crescent moon on sunset the 4th of October. That's the Festival of Trumpets. Count 14 days after that, you should have a full moon which is followed the next day by the Festival of Tabernacles, which lasts seven days, and the eighth day being the Day of Circumcision, or being a High Convocation. That's between the 18th through the 25th of October. So there you have it. We have Rosh Hashanah on sunset the 10th of April. We have the Day of Preparation at sunset the 24th of April. Passover and the first day of unleavened bread is on sunset the 25th of April. The festival of weeks begins on sunset the 14th of June. We start counting on sunset the 15th of June, count 50 days, and that brings us to sunset the 3rd of August. We complete those 50 days. The next day is Pentecost, which is sunset the 4th of August. From that, we go to the first day of the seventh month, which is sunset, the 4th of October. The 15th of that seventh month corresponds to our 18th of October. And there's seven days of tabernacles, and an eighth day was added by God as a high convocation, which I believe represents Christ being circumcised. I believe God will follow precedent as to his appointed times, as he did in Christ. I believe Christ was baptized on Rosh Hashanah, God's Rosh Hashanah, Exodus 12, 2 Rosh Hashanah, and that was before Passover, about two weeks, and that began his ministry that John described as the beginning. The three and a half years of Christ's ministry is the beginning that the Apostle John was referring to because it was the beginning of Christianity. And it took three and a half years of God revealing himself through the Logos of God, as the Logos of God, through the miracles and the signs and wonders that God performed through Christ. So that's the beginning. And that happened on the first day, which was Rosh Hashanah. Then we see Christ fulfilling the day that the Lamb is chosen to be the sacrificial Lamb for Passover. And that's on the 10th of the first month. And on the 14th of the month, you take the lamb and crucify it, and that's when Christ was crucified, on the 14th of the first month. At the setting of the sun, that began the 15th of that month, and that's when Passover begins, and it begins the seven days of unleavened bread. The Passover ritual being about 12 hours, 10 to 12 hours, depending upon how long the night is, because Passover is performed through the night hours, and that begins the seven days of unleavened bread. Jesus then rose on the third day, which was the day after the weekly Sabbath that fell in that time frame, fulfilling Leviticus 23. And he rose as the barley grain first fruit wave offering. 
And when we count the 50 days after the seven Sabbaths are completed, we come up with the day of Pentecost, when the Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter 2. So Christ fulfilled that appointed time as well, Pentecost, around 95 days after the first fruit wave offering, give or take. So if God fulfilled those appointed times, what are the other appointed times left for? They're left to be fulfilled and fulfilled with something substantial in the ecology of God and how he's going to do things and how he's going to fulfill his plan to make man into his image and likeness, Christ being that image. So that's what I come up with when I go old school. And I recommend people go old school because that's the way God did it for thousands of years. Maranatha.